when the temple is constructed, according to Jeremiah, Christ will, and, and uh, Ezekiel, Christ will rule from it. In fact, this is interesting too, just as a side note, verse 16 of Jeremiah chapter 3, when you multiply an increase in the land in those days, this is the Lord's declaration. No one will ever say again, the ark of the Lord's covenant. Let me repeat that. No one will ever say again, the ark of the Lord's covenant. It will never come to mind. And no one will remember or miss it. I'm not, for those of you listening on the podcast that can't see the screen, I'm only now starting to interject my own words. The entire passage from the Christian Standard Bible is, when you multiply an increase in the land in those days, this is the Lord's declaration, no one will say again, the Ark of the Lord's Covenant, it will never come to mind and no one will remember or miss it. Another one will not be made. That's all Scripture. Here's verse 17. At that time, Jerusalem will be called the Lord's throne, meaning he himself, God incarnate, will reign from it. And all the nations will be gathered to it. And the name of the capital L-O-R-D, meaning Yahweh, Lord, in Jerusalem, they will cease to follow the stubbornness of their evil hearts. So what I find interesting about that is the Ark of the Covenant is what? It's It's a reliquary box that contains the broken law of Moses. Remember that when the sacrifice for sin was made during the Day of Atonement once a year, the Ark of the Covenant is declared to be the footstool of God. And when the blood of the sacrifice is applied to the Ark of the Covenant, the image that's being set up is that God is staring from his throne in heaven to his broken law. And that once a year, every year, a priest renews this commitment by coming in and spilling innocent blood over the Ark of the Covenant so that when God looks down from high, the prophetic image is he no longer sees the broken law, he now sees the blood of the innocent. Do you see how that also links with Christ? So at this point in time, when Jesus reigns, the Ark of the Covenant will no longer have a ministry. They won't even have to remember it. But the mercy seat will still be there. That's why several times I've mentioned in Scripture, particularly in these passages, the mercy seat, when you imagine the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat sits on top of the Ark of the Covenant, It kind of functions like the lid of the thing. But the mercy seat is also literally the seat from which Christ will judge. The mercy seat is treated as a different object. The Ark of the Covenant, the broken law of God, has gone away. The mercy of God remains in effect. Isn't that neat? All right. Back to Revelation chapter 20, uh, into verse 7. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations at the, from the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the, sea, the sand of the sea. Excuse me. They came up across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. All right, so so imagine this before we continue. Christ has been reigning for a thousand years by this point in time. Satan is loosed. And in a very brief amount of time, what happens? Now remember, Christ was reigning in righteousness over the whole of the planet. But nearly the instant that the enemy is released... The only thing left to him, not in rebellion, is what we can kind of interpret to be the city of Jerusalem. So we the saints who have been resurrected, who have gone on, who have been made judges, who have been made rulers, who have been put in places of of authority as members of the family of God, we're next to the throne. 
but the people who are still alive, so to speak, they still have the choice between right and wrong. And through the influence of the enemy, which one do they choose? They choose wrong. As numerous as the sand upon the seashore that came across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are. We heard about them and their expulsion in the last chapter. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hell was never designed for human souls. The purpose of hell was to be the final resting place of the enemy and his angels. Unfortunately for us, when we read John chapter 3 at the bottom of the most famous verse of all of Scripture, Jesus reminds us that um, those who are condemned are con condemned because they have rejected the only begotten Son of God. And those that reject Him are what? They stand condemned already. So, that can, um, the second satanic rebellion, the enemy is released to test humanity, basically to hold a mirror to us to examine our own righteousness. And we fail that test. The nations are very easily deceived into rebellion against Christ. In an army under the enemy's leadership, Gog and Magog, that's potentially that's idiomatic language, that's a description, not necessarily a region, but I'll get to that in just a second. They attack the remnant of the faithful and the saints. But God himself destroys them kind of in the same um, way that he destroyed, well, that he took the sacrifice at, at uh, Mount Carmel. So call them a fire. God destroys them. And Satan is, ca excuse me, is cast into hell, only this time he is cast there permanently. So Gog and Magog... Gog and Magog enter scripture in multiple places. Uh, they come, Gog is, the, is, is a king. And he's an interesting figure in history because he lived around the time of Ezekiel. When we get to Christ's day, when we get to John's day, he's already been dead for a thousand years. Which is why we believe that uh, this is more idiomatic. This, this is not actually Gog back from the dead but it's, it's used to describe him and to describe the scene of what's going on. But as far as Magog is concerned, as far as this occupying force is concerned, which is what we're talking about, Ezekiel 28, or 38 rather, uh, looks more like the Battle of Armageddon, described in chapters 18 and 19, than it does here. Ezekiel 39, on the other hand, does kind of look like this event. So are there two invasions? Are they literally... Magog. So again, Magog, the nation or the, the ethnicity. Magog was the grandson of Noah, and he's often referred to in Scripture as the people of the north. And there are a lot of pastors out there that try to identify what that nation is, what that group of people is. They call it China, they call it Russia, they call it Rome, they call it whatever they can to try to label somebody else. Josephus, who was a, the Roman historian um, 70 years after the, the resurrection of Christ, calls them the Scythians. That's a people who were native to the Caucasus Mountains who lived around the area of the Black Sea and in that region of just north of Asia Minor. Now, the Caucasus Mountains is interesting because a bunch of different people descend from there, including Caucasians. I'll come back to that in just a second. According to Historia Britannum, which was written in 828, the people of the North Magog, by the scholars and the monks of those days, were actually the Goths, the Germans, the people who were the ancestors of the Celts and the British. Which is a very odd thing for you to say about yourself. Hey, we're going to be part of the army that goes to war against God. 
they were taking this stuff very much at face value, trying to do their homework. Some refer to them, uh, Johannes Magnus, who lived in the 15th and early 16th century, uh, thought of them as the Scandinavians, the people that had migrated up to Finland, Sweden, and, uh, well, the Russias as well. Rabbi Shimeo uh, Gransfeld, who lived in the 19th century, thought that they were the Mongol invaders, Genghis Khan and that, that group of people. So what I'm trying to say is before anybody labels Magog in this capacity, the only person, uh, John, knew who he was talking about. The people John was immediately writing to knew what he was talking about. For us to put a label on it, being where we are right now and not having the same information that they took at face value is almost absurd. Again, because there are so many people you can demonize with this kind of thing from an uneducated point of view. But anyway, when we're talking about anything from the book of Genesis, from the tableau of the nations, when you see names like Ham, when you uh, see Canaan, when you see Magog, that refers to an ethnicity that branched out across the world that was common knowledge in John's day that has been since lost to us, for the most part. There, uh, again, we may side with Josephus because he was a contemporary. But even then, the Scythians aren't necessarily the Scythians anymore because they too migrated all over the place. All that to say, an army will come, it will have numerous people, it will corner Jerusalem, and God will defeat it. So anyway, moving on, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. They tried to get away from God, and they couldn't, in other words. I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were open, books plural. Another book was open, which is the book of life. What we're talking about here is the ledgers were open. When it says the books, what they're talking about is an accounting term. Basically, the ledgers were laid open. Who has read in their ledger? Who ha who's in the black? Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead and were in, that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, each one judged according to their works. Now incidentally, Hades right here, does not, it, it, that's not another way of saying hell. Hades is a Greek term referring to the kingdom of the dead, the place of holding for the souls. Basically, if there's anybody else that's left in that, that area between Abraham's bosom and the place of torment, they have now been put forth in front of the white throne to be judged. And each one was judged according to their works. Well, let me caveat to say the ones that were found righteous wouldn't be in there in the first place because they've already moved on. They've, they were taking place during the, the, the Bema seat judgment. Excuse me. Verse 14, death and Hades were then thrown into the lake of fire. Now what that should say to us is that death itself, the kingdom of death, the holding place of the souls without bodies was chucked into non-existence. It was obliterated because there's no need for it anymore. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And that concludes chapter 20. So the great white throne judgment, again, not the Bema seat judgment, this is the second resurrection when the place of the dead gives up everyone that was residing in it that was not found to be part of the saints. The, work, the, books of the, the ledger of people's works and the book of life were, bo were both open before the Bema seat. Basically, or excuse me, before the great white throne. So basically, everybody who is trusting in Christ for salvation, is, their name is written where? The book of life. 
And we can include the Old Testament saints in there too. So as God is looking down the ledger of the book of life, looking for these people's names, if he doesn't see it, okay, let's open the ledger of works. Now, the standard for what constitutes godly righteousness is who? Jesus Christ himself, the person who was without sin. Now be careful. You have two options. You can either be covered with Jesus' righteousness, his righteousness put on your account, in which case you'd be in the Lamb's Book of Life, or the ledger of your own life will be open, and you can only stand on your own righteousness. And if we have to stand on our own righteousness, what happens? We stand condemned already. If the benchmark is Jesus, what that means is someone who stands before God in order to get out of the great white throne judgment, they have to give evidence in his own ledger that they have lived as righteous a life as the Son of God himself, the second Adam, the person in whose image we have been made. It's not possible. It is simply not possible. <sighs> there is none righteous, no not, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. kingdom of death is ultimately destroyed and those who are in front of the great white throne stand condemned already any questions or comments up to that point before we dismiss do I think there'll be different degrees of punishment um, my interpretation is no. I, I know that uh, there's a lot of extra biblical sources out there that say that there are seven circles of hell, each one with varying degrees. Um, that's Dante literally ri writing a divine comedy. And granted, he does accept that from, from other things that were passed around. But um, in, in the biblical end of things, we have this really bad image. And, and it's, I don't think that it's necessarily our Sunday school coloring books. I think it's more along the lines of culture trying to influence the way that we think about God's word. That uh, if, if you are this kind of sinner, you end up in this level of hell. The Bible doesn't say that. The way that the Bible describes hell is not the, the devil's job isn't to torment you so much as he is to trip you up and then point at you while yelling at God, you're not the great creator because look at what your creation is. The devil is trying, the enemy is trying to discredit God using us, using his creation. If he can get us to mess up, then he can go before the throne and say, you're as flawed as they are. These things that you made, these hairless apes, are nothing more than animals. That's what he wants to do. He wants to rob God of his glory. Rob God of his majesty. He wants to assume the place of God. He wants to basically prove that he could be a better God than God is God. And he wants to use us as the pawn in that game. And if we let him, he'll succeed. The Bible only gives one punishment. And that's to be thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where there is anguish for all eternity. I hate to say it. Part of me wishes that there were those layers. But the devil is not your jailer. He's a prisoner with the rest of whoever is in there. 
He is not the king of hell. He is its slave. And there he will be as well. Any others? Now that I've depressed you all, next week we will talk about the other side of that equation. Next week we will talk about heaven. We will talk about the place of rest for the soul, which is referred to in the Bible as paradise or Abraham's bosom. And we will also talk about the unveiling of eternity itself. And I hope that we're all here. And I hope that you're excited about that. Because this is what we've been building up to this point. I know there's been all this gloom, doom, battle, and bloodshed. But John, in the very back of the book, the very last word he says is Maranatha. Even so, come. Basically, he's telling us that with all the bloodshed, with all the torment, with all of the, with all of the evil that we were going to endure, wait till you see the end. Because from the, from the apostle's perspective, the end is worth all the means. Everything that we and the people after us and the people before us, everything that we would have had to have gone through, will be worth it when we see the kingdom of God in its full beauty. So please, be here for session 33. I want you to read Luke 16, 19 through 31. That's the parable of Lazarus. As well as Revelations chapter 21, Revelation apostrophe S. Not that there's more than one revelation. Revelation chapter 21 and 22. And I want you to think about these discussion questions. First, what have you been taught about what happens to the soul after our physical death? Or what do you have in mind? A lot of us have this kind of um, built-in theology, if you will, this functional theology. When, when we die in almost the Bugs Bunny cartoonish type of fashion, what happens? Some of us imagine just in that way that we will go up in a toga with little flappy wings with a halo and we'll grab a harp. What, what is it that you actually think happens to a person once they meet physical death? Second question, what do you think the new earth will be like? I don't want us to, we'll, we'll talk about the new heaven as well, but what do you think about the new earth? What will the new earth be like? We, there's a lot of, of books from the prophets that talk about that, about a different reality that we're going to be involved in, where even the physics of the world that we live in right now will be outdated. A new heaven and a new earth. What will it be like? Remember to journal your thoughts, discuss it with your friends. As iron sharpens iron, so do friends sharpen each other. Anything else before we dismiss? Anything from the folks online? Then let's bow our hearts. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the hope that is ours through Christ Jesus. We thank you for the price that you paid to make that hope possible. And we thank you for the safety that we have to be able, Lord, this generation is blessed to not only be able to study your word in peace and in safety, but that we are among one of the first generations to be able to possess a copy of it of our own. So help to infuse within us a desire to know the Word of God better and through its pages to know you better. Set us to this purpose so that we might not just be scholars of your Word, but true disciples who take its meaning and who make it a reality. For it is in the most holy name of Christ we pray. Amen.